Hello, and welcome to Eyes on Success, a weekly program covering a wide variety of topics of interest to people with vision loss. I'm Nancy Goodman Torby. And I'm Pete Torby. So you slept on the side of the mountain, I guess. Yeah, we did. We spent a couple of nights on it. But the second night, we came down and because we summited late in the afternoon, a storm came in that was a bit earlier than we'd expected. We knew it was coming, but it came in a couple of hours early. And then we spent about seven or eight hours coming down the mountain in the dark. And then a group member that had gone ahead a little bit to find our bivvy spot for the night said, hey, we found the perfect spot, not only slope head down to feet, but also left to right. And you were right in saying that we had to sleep in our harnesses, roped up and fastened to the wall just to make sure that we uh, didn't fall off the mountain in the side of, in the middle of the night. As you can hear, today's guest is a pretty intrepid guy. And by the way, it doesn't sound like the most comfortable place to me to be sleeping on the side of a mountain. Well, at least he was strapped in. We'll speak with John Churcher, an avid rock climber, about what rock climbing means to him, how he does it as a blind person, and about some of his adventures, including scaling the Eiger, a several-day endeavor, which required them to sleep on the side of the mountain. But first, for our tip of the week, this week's tip comes from John Churcher. With any adventure... It doesn't matter what age you are. I think that you can get out there and give it a go. So whether you're 10, 20, in your 50s or 60s, I'm a great believer in that. Why not? You know, there's no reason why you can't give it a go. It might not be for you, but you won't know until you've had a go. Sometimes you have nothing to lose and you may as well just try something new. Exactly. And you might find that it's absolutely the thing that you've been looking for for however long, and you think, yep, yeah, this is great, and I'm going to continue with this. As you did. Yep, yeah, definitely. And as you'll hear, John didn't exactly start his rock climbing and other adventures very early in life. He really did make a big change later in life and decided to just be a little bit brave and try something new. And try it he did. Support for Eyes on Success is provided by... Envision Glasses, a smart glasses solution that helps visually impaired people read text, recognize objects, make video calls, and much more. Information and demos are available at CSUN booth number 1011 or at letsenvision.com slash glasses. And by... The Intracortical Visual Prosthesis Project, as described in episode 2151. Interested volunteer participants can learn more at www.chicagolighthouse.org slash ICVP or contact them at ICVP at IIT.edu. You are listening to Eyes on Success. 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 Let's start by meeting John. Hi, my name's John Churcher, and I'm from Birmingham in the UK. I have Usher syndrome, and what that means is that I am deafblind, so can hardly see anything, and I wear a couple of hearing aids. I'm a climber, so I climb indoors and outdoors. And I love other extreme sports. And we'll talk about some of that in detail. But you mentioned that you were blind and partially deaf. Can you tell us the extent of your vision issues and what assistive devices you use? Okay. So with my vision, I have no peripheral vision whatsoever. I can't see anything at night. So total night blindness. And during the day, it... I suppose it's all a bit fuzzy and blurred and broken up. So there's no real detail there either. But I, I can tell, you know, the difference between light and dark. And you use screen readers and I presume a cane or a dog to get around? So, yeah, I use screen reader. I use voiceover. So that's on iPad, iPhones. And I find that a real big help. 
And I, I do have a cane, but I also have a guide dog as well called Daisy. Eyes on Success is made possible in part by our corporate partners. Underwriting pairs the impact of targeted marketing with the integrity of community goodwill. Learn more by sending an email to hosts at eyesonsuccess.net. This week's focus topic is rock climbing indoors and outdoors, including on some very large sheer cliffs. Well, in the intro, you mentioned that you do some rock climbing and other extreme sports. Is this something that you got into when you were younger? No, it isn't actually. I it was about eleven years ago now. I did a charity abseil of a, a, a building where I live locally, with about a hundred foot one. And I thought, hmm, I kind of like the idea of rock climbing. And presumptuously, I thought I'm going to be good at this. So I had a friend who was in the local mountaineering club. She invited me to come along and. It turned out that I actually was good at it because then after a couple of years, I managed to make it onto the Great British Power Climbing Team. And I spent seven years on that. This is not a specifically blind climbing team, I assume. No, it isn't. It was um, a team with people with all sorts of disabilities. They're split into different categories. So you've got the blind, they're split into their B categories, then upper and amputee which is your arm or leg amputees and then people in the rp category so that people that may have ms and brain injuries and that sort of thing that was very intrepid of you to get involved in such an activity later in life a lot of times such activities start with an interest when one is young but it gets harder to start something new like that when you're older i suppose it does i, I never really thought of it that way i i didn't if I'm honest, I didn't know rock climbing sort of existed when I was younger. So I'd, I'd never seen another person climb. And then to me, it was just a case of, I think I'd be good at that. I'd like to have a go at it. And I, like I said, I found I was good at it. And it was um, something I'm really passionate about now. So my impression of rock climbing for somebody who can't see is that it's actually pretty straightforward, especially if you go to a rock climbing facility, they've got these handholds and footholds spaced out on a wall. And once you can find the next one by feel, life is good. But you do this outdoors and on some extremely large surfaces. Yeah, I, I would say sometimes when you're climbing outdoors, it actually can be a bit easier because you when you're climbing indoors and they're particular colours and they're the, the different grades, somebody, will show, you know, you have a sight guide at the bottom of the wall and they'll say, put your hand, left hand up to, let's say, 11 o'clock and you've got to stick to that particular colour. But when you're climbing outdoors, unless it's an extremely hard route, you generally have anything included in your climb. So it doesn't matter where you put your hands and feet, it's all in, but indoors, it's like, Oh, you get your hand, you get your hand off that red hole. You're on a blue route. So, in some certain t t situations, it can actually be easier outside. I would think that, in some sense, rock climbing is kind of almost suited to someone who's blind because a lot of it relies on balance, which you have to have good balance if you're walking around with your eyes closed. And a lot of it is based on a tactile sensation of feeling where you are having a good sense of where your body is, where your hands are, balance, feeling the rocks. And that's something that blind people deal with a lot. Yeah, def definitely. On, in the lower grade routes, you're, you're absolutely right there. It's all about touch and feel and you get a good sense of, yeah, I can balance well on that piece and I can pull up on that handhold good. It's not until you get into the extreme grade then it sort of like becomes a bit more tricky and you sort of like got to be guided or know the route that you're on to be able to sort of like grab the hold or the particular pocket that you're going for just to make sure that you don't fall off. Yeah, I guess if you can't see, you don't want to spend a lot of time searching out the next handhold that might be acceptable. No, definitely not. And you'll find that when you've been climbing as a blind climber for 
quite some time, you develop what we call good lock-off strength. So that's the ability to hang on to one hold while you're searching for the next one or while you're waiting for your sight guide to decide where you should go next. So just to be clear, um, you're not completely crazy doing this activity. You climb with ropes, as everybody else does, so that if you do lose your footing or your handhold, you're not going to fall far enough to get injured. No, no, definitely not. Um, it's slightly different when you're outside because this is what's called lead climbing. So that's where you're tied in at the bottom. You've got your belay partner. But as you're climbing up, you're actually putting your protection in. So you're you're making it safe for yourself as you go up. So there is a slight risk that you'll put a piece of gear in and then you're you're climbing up, even if it's only two or three feet, and you for whatever reason you slip or you fall off that. So you then fall the length that it is back to your neck protection plus that same distance again. So if you're three foot up, you'd have a six foot fall. So there is a little risk there, but you still minimize it as best you can by putting in the gear where appropriate. And you just keep doing that all the way to the top. Yeah, you do. Yeah. And then when you get to the top, you set up what's called a belay point, make yourself safe, make sure that you then can safely belay the person up that was um, belaying you from the bottom. And when we say all the way to the top, you are known for having climbed the Eiger, which is an enormous mountain. How far is it to the top of the Eiger? It was um, 3,970 meters. So that's quite, uh, quite a tall. So for Americans, that's like 12,000 feet. Yeah, I should have done my conversion. I think it's it definitely at least 12. It might be just over 13,000 feet, but don't quote me on that one. Yeah, we, I climbed that back in now 2015. How long does such a venture take? That, um, on this occasion, we knew that it would take longer because me being blind, it would inevitably a bit slower. Not at everything, but when it comes to this mountain, I was a bit slower. But we knew that, we planned that in, and it took three days and two nights to do that. So you slept on the side of the mountain, I guess. Yeah, we did. We spent a couple of nights on it, one going up, and then following day, we set off early-ish, summited, and then we had to then bivy out on the mountain, as you call it, again on the second night. And when Pete nonchalantly said you slept on the side of the mountain. I am, assume this meant you um, hung a cot off the mountain and just kind of pounded some supports into the rock? Or did you actually find a flat enough spot that you could lie down? On both occasions, we didn't find any flat spot to sleep on. The first one wasn't too bad. It was just sloping downwards. So if you imagine you got your head upright, your feet were just pointing down. So that was um, the first night. A little bit uncomfortable. You have your, your, little, your thin foam mat underneath you. But the second night we came down and because we summited late in the afternoon, a storm came in that was a bit earlier than we'd expected. We knew it was coming, but it came in a couple of hours early. And then we spent about seven or eight hours coming down the mountain in the dark. And then group, group members that had gone ahead a little bit to find our bivy spot for the night said, hey, we found the perfect spot. It turned out this perfect spot not only sloped head down to feet, but also left to right. And you were right in saying that we had to sleep in our harnesses, roped up and fastened to the wall just to make sure that we uh, didn't fall off the mountain in the, side of, in the middle of the night. Oh, gee. And I guess in addition to hauling yourself up the mountain, if this took three days, you had to carry enough supplies and all this equipment with you. Yeah, we did. We kept it to bare minimum what we took. But yeah, you're right. We took our food, our water, and mainly just sleeping bag and bivy bag, which is uh, like a waterproof case in that your sleeping bag goes inside. So it's the same size as your sleeping bag, but it's waterproof so that when it rains, your sleeping bag doesn't get wet. So how much extra weight are you carrying on this venture? 
Um, I'm not sure, really. Um, we also had ice active, so we kept it as light as we could. Maybe anything about 8 to 10 kilos, so that would be um, maybe 20 pounds, that sort of weight. So not, not a, a horrendous amount of stuff, but I must confess we didn't take any change of clothes for those three days. <laughs> Were there water sources on the mountain, or did you have to bring up three days of water? There is water on the, the mountain when you get to where the snowfields are, but not recommended to drink that. So we did take our water with us, but we took enough, uh, but probably not quite enough to finish off, sort of like run out half a day before we got down. So almost enough, but not quite I hate running out of water before you get back to the trailhead. That's such a bummer. Yeah, it definitely is. Yeah, it's like, oh, I could really do with a drink. And uh, yeah, you haven't got enough. But that's one thing with weight wise. You take the water up, but you don't have to carry it back down. Right. You mentioned a little bit earlier about having a sighted guide. What is the role of the sighted guide and how do you work together? What um, the site guide or site guide does is ideally you want somebody that knows you. I got my, I had my friend Mark, he guided me on the Eiger. And now I've got my, um, my friend Lauren and Adrian. They also help me when I'm out climbing indoors. And the role is they have a look at the route on the wall, whether it's a, a bouldering route or a, a rope climb. And I suppose the same for outside and they would try and locate when you're outside where the best way to go is or say that might be a pocket or a jug so that's like a big hole that you can put your hands on and then inside they would do the same sort of thing but they looking at the colored route and then trying to work out how the route setters set it to make it as easy as the route is set for you to do it doesn't mean that the route going to be easy but they can tell you they like tell you where to go are they typically climbing up ahead of you or behind you? When it's rope climbing, they will climb after you've done the route to our climb or get to the top and they'll load me back down and then they'll have a go. And then I'll boulder in, they're sort of like just stood behind me for, from a safe distance so they don't get landed on. And then they'll, um, they'll have a go at the route if it's one that they fancy afterwards. But that's only going to work for a relatively short route. You're not going to do that for a three-day climb up the Eiger. No, no. With um, The Eiger was slightly different um, with the sight guide. My sight guide was actually in front of me. So Mark was in front. He had his backpack on. And then I, I basically held on to his backpack or took the backpack for those three days. So when he was going up, up a step and that I could feel from the movement that we would I would need to be stepping up or stepping down and it would be only if it was like an extremely tall step that he would actually say you know you need to step higher now but I think you know it would have been a bit draining if he had to tell me every single footstep for three days. You made it sound just now like you had one hand on his backpack does that not make it even harder to climb up if you only have one hand available for handholds? With the Eiger, it was steep, but steep enough so that you could actually, you know, hold onto a, the backpack most of the time. There were a few sections where we actually had to do rope climbing. So then he would have climbed up and then I would just climb up as I would normally climb up. So I'd, use, I'd have both hands free then to climb up. Did you ever feel that you were in danger? I mean, you must get scared at some point. I suppose I, I was pretty relaxed about it. It got a bit more worrying when he would say, don't fall now. But I knew <laughs> at that point. That, yeah, I, I, I do wish that he hadn't said that at a certain time. That I'd like, I know that there, there was always a risk that you could slip or whatever and, you know, slide down. But when he would say that, it's like, I wish you hadn't told me that, because that actually makes me, I suppose it made me tense up a little bit more, thinking I've got to be really careful now. Well, that's interesting. We don't do any technical climbing, but we do a lot of walking and hiking. And there was a memorable hike we took at Mesa Verde, which is a really nice United States National Park. 
And we inadvertently got onto a trail that had a very steep, very long drop off that kept getting longer and longer and longer as we went. And Pete was just la di da following me up the trail. He figured, you know, if it was wide enough for both of his feet, it was infinitely wide. Well, it wasn't. And um, it gave him a real attitude adjustment when I made him feel the side and he realized what the other choice was if he missed the trail with his foot. Yeah, it's just like that. You're sort of like, you're aware of the danger, but you're sort of happily going along, being nice and relaxed and comfortable and, I suppose, um, super composed about what you're doing. And then something like makes you tense up a bit and you're like, hmm. I'm not quite enjoying this as much now. <laughs> Wish you hadn't told me that. Yeah, that was exactly our situation. I didn't have to look down at the thousand foot precipice that was just a few inches on one side of us. So as long as I didn't know it was there, I was fine. <laughs> yeah, exactly. There's nothing going to touch you, sort of thing. <laughs> you do other extreme sports and other adventures in addition to rock climbing. Can you? Tell our listeners about some of those. I suppose, yeah, the things that I've done, I maybe not super extreme, but I've, I'm learning to ski and snowboarding. And then, like you, I've, um, we go out hiking. So we go to some of the main mountains in an area called the Lake District in the UK. So they're not massively thousands and thousands of feet mountains, but they're still a challenge. And um, we really enjoy doing that. Um, what other things I've done? I've done caving, not extreme, but go out on a tandem. So all all sorts of different things. There's a, an adventure out there and something different to try. We, me and Lauren, we, we like to try and um, see if we can have a go at it. You don't spend a lot of time sitting in a chair, I gather. No, no. I try not to. No, that can get a little bit... Um, that's uh, about boring at times. From looking at your web presence, I gather Lauren is your partner in the T-shirt twins enterprise. Yeah, she is. Yeah. So yeah, with the T-shirt twins, that's me and Lauren. We started that a few years ago because I couldn't wear my sponsored T-shirts when I was climbing. I had to wear my team kit. So Lauren thought, I know it'd be good if I wear that, and then at least it's still promoting the brand, and then. I don't know really for what reason we decided then let both wear the same t-shirt and it would get us noticed. And then from then it just developed into we wear quite a lot of the same t-shirts, jumpers, jackets, that sort of thing, just to get us noticed. But it's also part of my or our little mission to anybody can have an adventure. It just happens to be uh, what we call it, t-shirt twins, adventures with side loss. Well, it sounds like you guys make a good team and are up for almost any new adventure. Yeah, we are, definitely. Like I say, even if you have a disability, you can have an adventure, or even if you don't. And it, it, it doesn't have to be a big, massive one like climbing a mountain or anything like that. It can just be going to your local park as, as a starting point or that could be your big adventure, you know, something that both pushes you outside your comfort zones a little bit. But once you get back home, you think, yeah, I'm really glad I did that. What is the next adventure you have planned? Me and Lauren, we're now going to start doing some what they call winter skills. So that's where we go into the mountains of um, to start with Scotland, hopefully get a bit of snow, and then we'll learn how to do Things like avalanche awareness, to, uh, build snow holes and how to arrest yourself if you find yourself starting to slip down the side of a mountain. So we're going to start with that and then um, hopefully do some more uh, bigger mountains and then time permitting and other things, then maybe some even more bigger mountains. So that's our next little adventure that we've got on the horizon. But we also take anything that comes out of way if we think yeah that's good we'll give that a go never a dull moment no no there isn't i'm going to be 50 in a couple of years so i'm going to look at certain little things that i might want to do for that and a big adventure is something that i've always wanted to do 
You are listening to Eyes on Success. 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 Now for this week's final item, how to learn more about John Churcher's adventures and how to contact him. Well, you have quite a web presence, John, and tell our listeners where they can find out more about some of your adventures. Yeah, if you want to look up the, the, my website, that uh, www.johnchurcher.co.uk and the t-shirt twins is www.tshirttwins.co.uk and we're also on Instagram and Facebook as the t-shirt twins. And if people had questions for you, is there a way they could contact you directly? Yeah, if they just drop either either those websites or any of them, actually, if they just get in touch, there's contact um, in, information, you know, details on there. And then I get straight through to me and I, I'm more than happy to answer any questions about anything. And as usual, you can find all of that contact information in the show notes associated with this episode at www.eyesonsuccess.net. And this is a great time to talk about the search feature on our website. Besides John's exciting adventures, we've talked to many people who are in many interesting kinds of extreme and non-extreme sports of all kinds through the years. And if you use the search feature on our website and put in a keyword such as sports or any particular sport, you're likely to find a show about that. And Nancy, I thought maybe you could tell our listeners some of the various sports that we've covered through the years. Well, under extreme sports, you'll find several people who did the Ironman triathlon, marathons, ultra marathons, one guy who did seven marathons in seven days on seven continents, whitewater kayaking, hiking, ski racing, at the Paralympic level, canoeing through the jungle, where he ran into some interesting wildlife. And then we've also talked about a huge variety of less extreme sports, but some you might find surprising, like tennis for blind people, martial arts with weapons. So any sport you're interested in, we've probably talked about it. So check out that search page and enjoy some of those previous shows. That's it for show number 2208. Next week on Eyes on Success, we'll be talking with Ulysses Harmony Garcia about how she was able to successfully find rewarding employment in spite of having to overcome a number of obstacles, including her blindness. She preceded her job hunt by acquiring experience as a volunteer, participating in job training programs, and working as an intern and was finally able to successfully land a job. And if you want to hear about her journey, join us next week for that. And the following week, our guest will be talking about a book that he wrote about employment for the blind. So maybe you'll want to catch both of those shows. You've been listening to Eyes on Success, hosted and produced by Nancy Goodman Torpy and Peter Torpy. You can access the full archive of previous shows, subscribe to the podcast, and much more by going to our website, www.eyesonsuccess.net. If you have questions about anything you've heard on the show or have suggestions for future shows, send an email to hosts at eyesonsuccess.net. Thank you for listening and have a nice day.